Um, so welcome back for our panel discussion. Um, so I'm just going to introduce our speakers very briefly, and then everyone's going to present for about five to ten minutes. And then what we'd really like is just to open up um, for questions and discussion. And we can also bring in stuff that we were talking about earlier um, during the workshops. And um, also maybe if we can relate them back to the presentations. But it's really quite open. So anything that you'd like to talk about, we can to hear. Um, so, can you hear me? Should I hold the mic? Um, so, Nasmia is going to go first. Um, Nasmia Jamal is the Education Manager at the Poetry Society, and she taught English at an Inner London Comprehensive Sixth Form for many years. Um, then we're going to have Khadija George. Um, Khadija Sese George is the founder and publisher of Sable Lit Mag, Sable Lit Fest, and co-founder of the Mboka Festival of Arts, Culture and Sport in the Gambia. She's also the editor of several anthologies of work by writers of African and Asian descent. Um, and I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll stop there, it's very, uh, all the information is also on the website, so because we have very illustrious speakers with very long <laughs> lists of accomplishments. Um, and then finally, we will have Denise de Caris Narain, um, who teaches at the University of Sussex, and you have already met her. Um, okay, so I will pass over to Nesmia. I think, having said that, I was going to sit down. Maybe I'll stand just because I'm right underneath this. And I can't see you guys, and you can't see me. Um, so, yeah, so I'm the Education Manager at the Poetry Society. Um, and before that, up until November last year, I was a teacher at Sixth Form in Hammersmith for um, just over 12 years. Uh, so... I'm not an academic, I don't have a particular interest area beyond I work in poetry and education and I thought that actually what might be useful is to start a discussion by talking about some of my own personal experiences and kind of my own experience of um, kind of uncovering race and poetry and we were given this kind of brief that essentially asked us to think about issues surrounding race, poetry, known and unknown histories, identity, citizenship, education, curricula, like a really broad swathe of things. I'm just going to sort of jump around a little bit and talk about some of my own personal experiences because I think our own relationships with poetry and with school are all really, really different and it totally depends on kind of who your teacher was. I mean or kind of where you grew up and things like that. So I wanted to start off by thinking a little bit about my own school experience. Um, I grew up in South Wales and was one of very few South Asians in the town that I lived in. There was quite an established community of South Asians and of um, Chinese people and a very old group of um, Italian. There was a very old Italian community, but actually this is a fact that I keep coming back to is kind of weird thing about how far into the valleys we were was that the first black family that I remember in the town that I grew up arrived in 1997 and I'd already left home by then so it wasn't it wasn't Cardiff it wasn't Tiger Bay it was very much like the valleys and um, so it was a very particular context um, there was I don't think we studied any writers of colour in school until I got to A level. So I was I spent a lot of time in my local library. I read a lot of the books that um, I think Rachel had pulled up kind of these black women connect collective books in her session and certainly I kind of went through a lot of those books with apples and irons on the bar on the um, on the spine and tried to read a lot of women's writing and writing by people of colour but in school um, my only interaction was um, through poetry, and that was in um, a book called Six Women Poets, which was set for A-level when I went to school, and I did my A-levels in 1995 to 97, so to give you the context, and that was Grace Nichols. We studied Grace Nichols as one of three poets out of the six women poets, and um, it really just completely blew me away. Um, I was interested in poetry before, but I, Grace completely changed my life in terms of how I thought about language um, and I kind of sought her out so I hadn't been actively going to buy poetry up until then 
But certainly after I studied Grace Nichols, I went out and bought the, another of her books and another of her books. And I was really interested, without really knowing how to talk about it, um, in the way that she was kind of doing what we would now call intersectional work. So um, the fat black woman's poems were talking about so many things that I related to, but I couldn't quite explain um, at that point. I just knew that I loved them. Um, but then she stayed on the curriculum. So when I became a teacher, I was able to teach her all for all 12 years that I taught. Um, Grace Nichols was on the syllabus, and that was something that I thought was really important. Um, and then at home, because then we have like our home contexts, right? So we have the school context and what we're doing at school, and teachers hope that they're kind of activating what's going on at home and quite often they just don't know how and I'm fairly sure that none of my teachers knew what was going on in my home and my relationship to poetry which definitely came through um, Bollywood films and a kind of musical poetry tradition so you know there's this handful of families in South Wales in the valleys um, lots of doctors who'd kind of moved there um, Pakistani families my my own family was really interested in music and so we would have these music parties or like Mushaira or Methils um, and you know some, some hall in the valleys would get cleared out and white sheets would get put on the floor and we would have a musician who would sing and the po that's poetry, you know, the lyrics for what people went for um, did not understand a single word, do not speak Urdu, barely speak Gujarati but that kind of the cadence and the musicality of poetry and that love of kind of sharing with an audience definitely came from that and all of my early memories of Bollywood were of these films where the main character is both a courtesan so like a dancing prostitute sex worker and they're always a poet as well so the thing about them is that they write these amazing amazing heartbreaking lines and they do really dramatic things like dance on glass um, or get into kind of shipwrecks with elephants or whatever. <laughs> you know, and there's no one in my school that would have known that that's kind of where my poetic sensibility was coming from. Um, so yeah, films like Pakiza really, really impacted on how I was experiencing poetry or the fact that my mum had this book that was given to her by this very mysterious man um, because she, she and my dad had been together since they were 16, but there was this mysterious man that had given her a book of translated Sanskrit love poems. I was obsessed with them. There were the most sexy poems that I'd ever read. There was poetry in the house, and I think we often think that South Asian people, um, black people in our schools, for example, you know, do they have poetry books in their house? We make really weird judgments about what kinds of books people have or whether they have access to books. My house was full of books and poetry books. And my mum also took, I should really stop talking about my mum on these panels because one day she's going to realise that they've all been recorded and I'm sure. The other day I was at the launch of the London Borough of Culture and I was like, mum, I'm in the same room as Sadiq. And she's like, I know, I've just seen you, I'm watching it live on Facebook. <laughs> Bloody hell. Anyways, so my mum was obsessed with Vikram Seth, like full on, read a suitable boy, obsessed with Vikram Seth, had this poster from Waterstones of his, you know, the black and white picture of him looking all floppy haired and like super sexy. Um, that picture, she had a huge poster from Waterstones above her desk. And um, she took me and my brother to Hay Festival. So again, it would have been like mid 90s, whenever the suitable boy came out. And, you know, was in my best hippie finery. And she took us to see Benjamin Zephaniah perform. And, there were these moments, and I think whatever you take from today, and I know there are some young people here, maybe you've come with your school, just that moment is as important as anything that you learn in the classroom, because if it speaks to you, then you can kind of go back and you know that it's important um, and make something from it. And from that, I really started thinking about performance poetry somewhere in these stacks. There is some really, really compromising evidence of my teenage poetry self. Um, that someone else donated. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, I put, so when I first moved to London, I put on poetry nights. I had a poetry zine. I would put out work by people like um, Francesca Beard, Tim Turnbull, Selena Salova, Godden, um, you know, would go to these nights. So all of these things, these small things make a person's experience and these are all interventions. Um, every single person of color that I met in the poetry scene made it more accessible for me 
because what I was seeing was not that um, outside of this one person, or they're, and they're often women. Anyway, rambling. Went to university, extremely white curriculum, don't remember studying a single poet of colour. Went to King's. It's not like that anymore, I don't think. Could be. Um, but it was, yeah, nothing, absolutely nothing. And I became a teacher, and I think that's where I want to kind of drop off. So I'll talk a little bit about um, what spoke to young people. When I first started teaching, there was that AQA anthology. How many of you know what I'm talking about? This, the poems of yeah, are you a teacher? Yeah, it was so, it was so much fun to teach the poems of other cultures. Like I could recite all eight poems from the cluster that I taught in my sleep, and that cluster included poetry by Sajatha Bhatt, Manisa Alvi, John Agar, Tori Nichols, Derek Walcott, Intel's Darka, uh, some other people, some amazing people. It was phenomenal. It was the one thing that the kids enjoyed doing. Absolutely. So this kind of mo there was this moment in the curriculum where young people were really engaged in the GCSE classroom and it was through these writers of colour and that's been axed and it was absolutely the same at A level. So when I first started teaching A level it wasn't that interesting and then there was this syllabus that just came off before they introduced the linear A level so A levels were modular as you do different units and now it's just this two-year course and on the modular A-level, there was this option on the AQA exam board called Struggle for Identity Modern Literature. And it was a gift to anybody who wanted to teach identity-based writing, to allow students to have a real think about, in a really kind of structured way, how they were represented in writing. Because you could pick and choose from this four-page reading list of wider reading. You know, that that reading list that came from an exam board had things like Audre Lorde on it, Jackie Kay, Alice Walker, Finding the Voice, which is Amrit Wilson's book about South Asian women in Britain that came out in 78, I think, Heart of the Race, which is the only book from that period which was written by black women about being British and black that has a lot of poetry in it. Um, I think that's where I, I brought Charting the Journey in because it wasn't on the list, but it's from that same group of texts. You know, you've got this amazing gift and then of course Gove wants you to study with the romantics so that comes off um, so we're at this kind of point where the new A levels the A levels that I partly left because I was just like I can't teach this in a way that I feel good about um, the new A levels only have this one space in there in the coursework I think it is depending on the board where you can write about new writing and writers that are also people of colour, so black writers, South Asian writers, and so on. And the one thing that's good about that is that that particular part of the syllabus now has to be British writing. And while I'm not always keen on like limiting things to British, I think with writers of colour, we have a tendency to know more about, say, Alice Walker than we do about Jackie Kay, or about you know how many black British writers could you name? How many black British poets could you name? It's not... It's not a place where people feel that comfortable or confident because it's been taken out of our syllabus for so long. So before I left, and I know that Rachel was talking about this as well, all the kids in the class that I was teaching coursework did their coursework on the complete works too. So they were all on things like, so they were writing about Claudia Rankine. So, um, oh God, what is that called now? Citizen. Thank you. Yes, Citizen. Um, so some of them were writing about Citizen, Mona Arshi, Jay Bernard, Kaya Chingoni, Inua Elms. Um, we were reading Malika Booker, um, Patience Agbabi, Sarah Howe. You know, it's a real gift that we have all of these writers and we can be doing them in the classroom. Um, but you need to know about them. So I guess there are two things. One, a lot of my students found out about those, writing, those writers, not just from me, but because I brought them on a trip here and a table got laid out and all of the kind of relevant things that would fit into the specification were put out. So if you know a teacher or you are a teacher and you're thinking, well, how are my kids going to access this? Then bring them to the poetry library. If you're thinking there's no critical writing, Poetry Library has cuttings and reviews on most of those writers, so you can get that part of the syllabus from here as well as online. And finally, there are, 
it's monetized because you know people are writing books now but there are resources coming out i know that pearson because I've, I've written a section for the pearson book have started putting together a text that has um, kind of brief summaries of black British writers that could be studied at A-level. So it's kind of, people are making the best of a not ideal syllabus by offering some support, but you know, there will be resources and there are resources and I would really encourage you to not leave it, because I was really lucky, not everyone has kind of mysterious men that give their mother books about <laughs> Sanskrit poetry or Yes, sexy poetry books, you know, your mum your mom might not have a crush on Vikram Seth or the resources <laughs> to take you to a literary festival when you're a teenager. Your teachers are going to have to do that work for you and this is a good place to start. So that's, I'm done. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I hope you don't fall asleep when I do my bit now. <laughs> um, no, I think, I, I mean, I just came in here for about 10 minutes with people doing the workshops to look at, you know, the resources and stuff. And I learned so much in 10 minutes. It was incredible. So if you haven't had a good look, please have a look. And I might mention some things that are up there whilst I'm talking. Um, first, the first thing I'm going to start by saying, actually, is that I do want to pay... Um, I don't know if this was mentioned earlier on the day, due respect to James Berry, who recently passed away on the 20th of June. He was 93, and he edited one of the most definitive anthologies of black British poetry in contemporary times, which is News from Babylon, which is right there behind your head. News from Babylon, which is Bracciato and Windus. So, and that, that anthology inspired me to come and watch it. I looked through it and I saw people I knew, and I think, I'm not here. <laughs> I wasn't, nobody knew I wrote poetry then anyway, but I wasn't in it. So, um, and I'm going to return to my anthologies at the end um, of, what, of what I'm saying. And I'm going to kind of zoom through because I know what I've done is longer than 10 minutes and I hate it when people do that and I've done it. So I'm going to zoom through, okay? Um, but yeah, it was one of the anthologies that inspired me to be an anthologist and, and, and to publish more black British poets because they just weren't there. At the time when I discovered that, I was working at a place called Centre Prize in East London. Um, which is a community bookshop. And one of the people who started it off was a man called Glenn Thompson, who, and again, he inspired me because he lived half in London and half in New York. And I thought, oh, well, anybody can do that. So it's quite easy to do. And he had publishing companies on both sides. And one was called Writers and Readers in the UK, and it was one of the things that started off Centre Prize. And the other one in New York, it's like he had different imprints, and one was called Harlem River Press. He had Harlem River Press, Black Butterfly, and I, and I can't remember the other one. And in Harlem River Press, there was this amazing anthology called In the Tradition. And in the tradition, there's all these black writers under 32. And one of them was um, Ras it was edited by Kevin Powell. He took his name, Kevin Powell and Ras Baraka. Ras Baraka was a Murray Baraka son, who's now like a mayor or something of, in New Jersey, mayor or councillor. And Kevin Powell is just an amazing journalist. So check him out. He was a new, I think he did one of the last interviews on Tupac Shakur or something like that. He's, he's excellent. So those people share. And they did this anthology in the tradition. I thought, well, they've got that in America. We want that in England. So I went to Glenn Thompson and said, will you publish this? And he just smiled at me and said, well, why don't you do it yourself? I said, do what myself? He said, publish it yourself. And I thought, he's got to be kidding. He was not kidding. Anyway, so I did in the end publish it. And I did, um, I wasn't 100% happy with it. It's called Burning Word Flaming Images. Um, I'm kind of happy with it now because a lot of the poets have become famous. So instead of me selling it cheap, it's now the same price as it used to be how many years ago. <laughs> you know, I think I published this in 1996 or something like that. Anyway, we did the launch at, um, at Centre Price. That was all very funny. The other anthology that really inspired me, it wasn't uh, it came on, is, um, it was edited by a poet called E. Ethelbert Miller, who's like the poet laureate. He will forever be the poet laureate in Washington, D.C., but he's a great person who hooks people up as well. It's called In Search of Colour Everywhere. And I just looked at this book. It just looked gorgeous. You know when you kind of look at a book and you want to eat it? <laughs> you know, it was one of those kind of books for me, you know. So it's all of those kind of things led me into the anthology. And in fact, I'm not even supposed to be talking a matter about anthology. I'm talking about <laughs> um, some of the uh, publishers 
why we have black British publishers. And I, I think I then have changed the title of my thing. I called it Publishing Poetry is Not a Luxury. You might recognise a bit of that title from Audrey Lord has his quote, Poetry is Not a Luxury. So it's like publishing poetry is not a luxury because you don't really make money from publishing poetry. Not really very much. Even with people like Derek Walcott, who was, you know, a Nobel laureate, I don't think Faber made much money out of him, but at the end of the day, publishing poetry is not a luxury. And I call it that because publishing for people of African descent is radical. Then I call them radical poets. Because it's political and because publishing traditionally, all publishing traditionally since um, uh, I'm migrating here from, um, from the Second World War, publishing is not the only activity of, of, of black British publishers. It's just one of their activities. Pu publishing for them is a tool. They publish to educate, they publish to decolonize the mind, and they publish to fight for people's rights. They're campaigners for various rights for people in the Caribbean, Africa, and increasingly more fervently in the UK, um, as you know, as they became more and more fixed entities here. So that that was one of the things that was kind of stand out with Black British publishers and why and why we absolutely need them. Um, one of the main publishers, New Beacon, have got a website. Um, it's got um, basically they've got a, an archive, George Padmore Institute, and it's all online, very accessible, very easy to read. So you can read about their history, you can read about the books they published and why they're published and everything. It's a really good site to go to. You can just step, step in and come out of it, and loads and loads of images on there. So it's really good to check that out. And and one of the things that um, the the founder of New Beacon Books was a man called John LaRose. and for him it was publishing was part of his dream to change the world. He believed he could change the world through publishing, through educating people. And that is a line taken out, and I bought this just in case I forgot, Poems of Succession by Martin Carter, but it is over there, um, the, the soft copy is, is over there. And it's on page 14, and it's on the last lines um, taken out from, from that, and I'll just read up you. I do not sleep to dream, but dream to change the world. And that is where he got his inspiration from, and he published Mark, Martin Carter's books. He also published poets like, oh my gosh, my tongue is off in here already. He also published poets like Kamal Brethwaite, um, also published a magazine called Savakal. Um, and you know, New Beacon, like other publishers, would reveal voices of migrant stories, family stories. Um, which a lot of other poetry publishers, even up to today, would probably not be very interested in, and, and they were because they knew how important that was. Um, I'm going to skip quite a lot here. Another one of the main publishers at the time was Bogle Overture, and I'm just, I don't know why I heard that name as I came in, so you know about Bogle Overture. Um, and they were the first people to publish poets who you might have heard of, like Linton Quessy Johnson. They published him, and they published Lem Sisse as well. Um, and other important poets they published were people like Cecil Magendra, and more recently, uh, poets like Maureen Roberts. Um, even though Walter Rodney was not a poet, it's very important to mention him because his book is still a book that people relate to today, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. And his influence was so vast that he inspired poets to write poetry about him. Um, there was an event recently at Waterstones with Caribbean writers and Mervyn Morris from Jamaica, like the Jamaican poet laureate came over. And this is the first time I'd heard him say as heard him say this, and he said that basically, if you want to be taken seriously as a poet, you had to write a poem about Walter Rodney. Yeah. And there was this anthology that um, Bogulo Mature brought out, which had all these poems in it about Walter Rodney. And I did look at the names, they were all male poets, but no, okay. They were all male poets, very good <coughs> male poets. But you know, I just think someone we need to kind of start getting into this, and maybe we'll just do our own, you know, brought me in other poetry book and, and and do that. And so he kind of did that. So if you're going to be taken seriously, you've got to write a poem about Walter Rodney. He is he was so influential at that time, and still is. Um, so please look him up too. Um, um, right. That's in terms of both. Although with your Hansi Publications is another. Um, publisher I want to mention because they publish so many they're still publishing quite a lot of books today um, uh, uh, black black British titles um, including uh, David Davidine who teaches at, um, at Warwick he's gone back to Warwick now 
he's back at Warwick, um, his second collection called Cooley Odyssey. And more recently, um, a collection which is, I think, equally important is Zeta Holden, Striving for Equality, Freedom and Justice. Uh, Zeta, for I've known her, that seems to be most of her work in life has been a staunch trade unionist. They also publish um, an anthology called Moving Voices, which is basically celebrating performance poetry. So all these issues that a lot of black poets would find themselves in, in that they would find that regular publishers wouldn't publish them, they'd go, oh no, they're black poets, they only do performance poetry, and so we just really can't publish them, because it's performance. They celebrated that. They celebrated that by publishing an anthology called Moving Poetry, and it's got a DVD, a CD or DVD in it? One of those. Technology's moved so fast, I can't remember what it is. It's a CD or DVD in the back. <laughs> um, so this is kind of the value and importance of black British publishers because they're publishing, they're taking what other publishers would have considered as risks. For them it was not a risk, it was a necessity. Um, and one of the recent uh, poets in residence for New Beef was Jay Bernard, and they asked her to focus on something in their history to write about. And one of the things she, she focused on was the New Cross tragedy. And New Cross tragedy was 13 young people who died in an arson attack in the early 1980s. And, you know, and I, I just know that so many people who were around and aware at that time, what's happened with Grenfell will just kind of all relate at the time. Um, and, and when you think about it, when a tragedy happens, poets come out. Poets don't only come out, poets are called upon. So you have Ben Oakley at the moment, he is, he's got a poem and out on viral and the press and he's going to set up an event and I heard that Benjamin Zeppelin-Meyer is, is dedicated things as well. This is how poets are so important. I just believe that, you know, poetry should be part of our everyday lives, really. Um, so I'm just going to wrap up very quickly, I'm going to try and make it pretty, and just come back to anthologies again and because, um, talking about the importance of anthologies and because this amazing important anthology that has come out recently um, and it's not just black British poets in there it's also there's poets around the world in there and I'm going to pick on somebody because he picked on me Peter Khan. Peter Khan is here in the front and he edited this anthology and we had the launch in the British Library on the 29th of June and I could hear him bring this in like it's taken six years to do this and I went, mm -hmm. yeah Good anthologies can take that long, especially when you're starting work from new. It takes that long. But anthologies are important for three reasons. I think anthologies are important for three reasons. Number one, for a new emerging poets, they often get published alongside established poets. And as somebody said on that night, amongst your literary heroes, on the very next page, it's like, ah, I next to Jackie Gay. Or something like that, you know. So it's like, I'm equally as important as a poet. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. And Jackie would really say that herself. Anthologies are situated in a time and place that gives the social conditions of the time in, in a way that nothing else can, I believe. And we also, you also can get a sense of styles and voices of the time. And often one anthology will show a breadth of styles and techniques, experimental and traditional which produces, as you said, an excellent teaching tool. Mm. Again, like no, nothing else, like nothing else can, I believe. Um, so, and it's like, for example, like twice yet. It's weird that anthologies, people who read anthologies, when it comes to publishing, you kind of tend to be at the bottom of the file, as if to say that single collections are more important. I think they're more important. I edited an anthology with uh, Courtier Newland in 2000 called IC3, and twice this year, people have contacted me and said, "Oh, where can I get copies? I want to teach it." And I'm like, well, it, you know, it's not, not being reprinted. And a lot of time, black publishers do reprint books. This was done by Penguin. They didn't see enough money in it. They didn't reprint it. And so people have been saying to me, well, can't we put it on, on, can't we put it online? Can't you digitalize it? There's like 100 writers in that book. They weren't all poets. It was different works as well. 100 poets in that book. I would then have to go and contact the wall to make sure, to legalize, to put the work online. So we've lost it as a resource. And that's why anthologies are, are, you know, are really important in terms of what they do. This is an anniversary year for black British publishers. Alison and Busby, Alison and Busby, Margaret Busby is an amazing um, doyen of publishing. She has been publishing for 50 years and also Express Books. It's their 25th anniversary and their first book, Yardie, is actually been made into a film by Idris Elba. 
um, and that's, that's the 25th year. So it's also a very important year for anniversary year as well for publishers. So thank you for listening to us. some of my minutes, each of you, so I hope you appreciate that. <laughs> Belatedly. Um, it's kind of weird to be here because I'm surrounded by books that I spent a lot of time reading very closely when I was doing my PhD on Caribbean women's poetry, so I'm having this weird deja vu feeling, seeing all of these books that I know really, really well. And I was thinking as you were speaking about James Berry, because I didn't know he had died, actually. I knew he wasn't well, but I didn't know he had died. Um, that really, it would be good to read a poem from you for Babylon, and I'd be happy to do that if somebody could pass it to me, and maybe I could, because I think there might be a new cross poem in there. Really? That it might be. Uh, would you mind having a look to see if you could? Do you, uh, yes, you know, while you're talking. Is that okay? Just so we know. Yeah. Sorry, it's okay. So I guess um, when I was doing my PhD many years ago in the, in the mid 80s, early 80s. Um, it was possible to do a degree in African and Caribbean studies, which is what I did. I think you'd be hard pressed to find universities where you can do that now. Um, I think that shift has been both beneficial, the shift, shift away from area studies, as it was called then. At the time, I felt it was really useful because from my own perspective, my own kind of research interest, I found that um, kind of nationalist categories were becoming very constraining. There was a kind of limit around how we talked about race and all kinds of things. And the post-colonial as a category seemed a really useful way of getting out of what was becoming quite a constrained way of thinking about Caribbeanness in particular, which is where I was, what my interests were, were around. And so I think many of us working in Caribbean studies kind of leapt onto the, the post-colonial um, wagon, not that wagon, but just wagon, um, because it, it seemed like a more promiscuous way of thinking about the things we wanted to think about and write about, where we could muscle our way out of very narrow conversations about whether V.S. Naipaul as an Indo-Trinidadian was really Caribbean or not. Things tended to get very bogged down in that kind of uh, very race-specific sort of arguments. So the post-colonial, with its emphasis on hybridity, seemed to provide a really useful way out of that. And I think, to some extent, the post-colonial is still a very useful category. But these are categories that are strategically useful and are not in themselves, you know, a destination or a place to stay in. Um, so I know that we are already kind of in the post-post-colonial mode. But I think one of the risks of that is that um, if we don't keep mobilizing under that category, we risk losing those texts and writers and issues altogether. I think, as many of us who work in this environment know, universities, it seems to me, are moving more and more to a more conventional, retreating, retrenching, into a very conventional notion of what constitutes English literature. I think we have to fight to keep these texts, writers, and, and issues on the curriculum. This may seem very remote to you guys who are, who are you know, doing your A-levels and whatever, but it's really important that you are able to, to pursue the kinds of texts and concerns that you want, that you want to see texts that, you know, that, that engage you, that reflect the complicated kinds of uh, cultural contexts that you come from, or that you may come from, or that you know people who come from, or that you're interested in. Um, so it seems to me to be a really important thing to be fighting for. Um, when I first started teaching in the early 90s at Sussex, I had the privilege of teaching in the School of African and Asian Studies. At the time, we all you know, made a big fuss about how colonial this, this area studies thing was. You know, African and Asian Studies comes out directly from colonial, you know, from colonial um, history. So we were constantly fighting about that. 
Now that it's gone, I realize what we've lost because in the, we, we have now shifted to you know, a straightforward kind of English department with, with all the problems I think that that brings um, of, of having in a sense to keep, to keep fighting not to be swamped by the canon. I am not anti-canonical. Um, I think we, all of the writers that I'm interested in engage with the canon. But I think there is a sense in which one wants to find that canonical work being addressed alongside other kinds of texts and contexts. And that, I guess, is what I'm, I'm slightly worried about the direction that English is taking, not just at my university, but in many universities, where, where it is not uncommon to mention Derek Walcott and there be nada, nothing, no response. Um, I find that really, and I pick Walcott as a kind of example because whatever you think of him, he used to be really pretty well known. I would prefer to mention someone like Kamal Brathwaite. Nothing. V.S. Naipaul, again, contested figure, but you know, nobody's read him or heard of him. Okay, so each, you know, there are waves and writers have their time, but I worry a little that a whole kind of tranche of writing is being lost um, and the cultural context that trails those writers is also being lost. As if somehow those writers are of a more kind of naively expressive kind of phase, which is partly why when we were doing our little workshops this morning, I was wanting to really suggest that there are lots of continuities and as well as disjunctures in the earlier writers and the writer, writers writing now. I think some of that early post-Windrush writing um, and people like Walcott, Michael and all of them are still resonant today and speak to contemporary writers who are writing about more recent waves of migration. Not to say that these waves of migration are identical, they're obviously bringing with them very, very different kinds of histories, um, different kinds of violences, um, but, but I think there's a connection and I think it's important to have a sense of that longer trajectory. Um, otherwise it becomes too easy, I think, to, to dismiss this writing as not having a tradition. So I'm both invested in ideas of tradition and want to question it. Um, you know, I think it's Bell Hooks who says it's okay to dispense with identity if you have one or if you've had one. If you haven't, then you're constantly kind of wanting to, to sort of uh, put a break against that kind of deconstructive um, thing. So I guess in a way I'm not speaking personally, but in a way it's kind of personal. Um, in the sense that when I first started teaching, when I first became involved in intellectual labor, um, I guess I felt I was having to speak in kind of two ways. So I guess to, to, to you younger people who are coming into education and hopefully going on further, is to think about what you really care about and to hang on to it. Because you may find that the institutions that you arrive in and that you study in require you to do a lot of work to keep those interests going. Because it's very easy to kind of give in and think that you know, the other stuff, the more mainstream stuff, is the important stuff. So you may have to fight a bit. Um, I certainly felt that I was kind of caught between audiences. Uh, I caught the time at which I started teaching was the time at which people spoke of, if you can imagine it now, it seems kind of laughable, the theory wars, you know. Theory was really hot. People were really fighting over literary theory. I don't know if you can imagine that. You're doing your, your A levels. It wasn't exactly fisticuffs, but it was pretty damn close. It really mattered. It really mattered how you talked about text. That was really important. We seem to have drifted away from that a little bit in the sense that the arts and humanities are in such an embattled position at the moment that we're the wars we're having now are just the wars of, yes, it matters, talking about culture, talking about literature, talking about writing really matters. And it matters now, I think, more than it has ever mattered, you know, even more than it has ever mattered. And so making sure that we, we are as inclusive and as diverse as possible, um, without that becoming the cliche, you know, an institutionalized cliche that it is rapidly becoming, it is, seems to me to be really important. Um, I've kind of rambled a bit, but I guess, what I'm saying is, 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 yeah, that I think it's important to continue 
trying to make these arguments, making these arguments. Um, and I think that contemporary black British and Asian writing, certainly the poetry, is um, incredibly uh, diverse, incredibly complex. It is not possible to speak about the black experience. It was never possible to speak about the black experience. But I think critics did speak about the black experience as a kind of strategic ploy to make sure that those kinds of experiences and, and um, interests were represented. So it seems to me that the, the position I feel I'm in, and maybe other people do as well, I don't know, is one of both having to strategically mobilize under identity categories while all the time constantly wanting to unravel and undo those identities. Being both constructive and deconstructive at the same time. It seems to me to, that we have to have that kind of um, twin strategy. So anthologies, yeah, I agree, are really useful. I was reading the, the second edition of 10 um, oh, no, no, no. that um, Karen McCarthy edited. And one of the things she says in her introduction, she asks the question, is it, what, what is it that, keep, that unites these black and Asian British poets? She says the thing that really unites them is their idiosyncratic interests. Okay? That, in other words, it is the differences between them that comprise their difference. I love that. It's completely contradictory and paradoxical and whatever. But it seems to me um, to be a really good example of the way in which um, that idea that somehow black writers cannot be, should not be afforded the complex range of poetic interests, aesthetically, thematically, all of those things, seems to be something worth fighting for. Do you can't find it. You can't find it. Okay. Right, the, the kind of uh, yeah. yeah. In that case, um, maybe we could just read a poem from News for Bella yeah. in, in memory of in memory of James. In memory of James. Yeah. But I too also wanted to, to read a poem about about New Cross because it seems to me to that yeah, to it's speak the right to the speak seems like the right yeah. time without it wanting to seem opportunistic or any of those things. But um, it just is such a strong of, like people who want to go away and look for New Cross poems. Yeah. Jay Bernard was commissioned to write a, a cycle of New Cross poems based on like time spent at the George Padmore Institute. So looking at all of the interviews and they're written quite a lot of them are written from the perspective of the young people that died in the fire. Um, and they're available in the New Beacon Books collection. Yeah which is really worth looking at, particularly mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. So does anyone have any questions for our speakers? We've only, we actually don't have that much time, only about five minutes, so maybe we could have just a couple of questions and maybe we could hear it all. One of the things I was going to mention, because I totally forgot, I'm talking about Peter's book, and it's called The Golden Shovel, which is it? The Golden Shovel, mm -hmm. okay, and it's in celebration of 100 years anniversary of Gwendolyn Brooks. We don't talk about or do we remember about that's why it's important for Black British poets to be in that collection as well. And the one thing that I was going to say with my Poetry Society hat on is that aside from trying to find kind of poets that have been published that you can kind of read in class together or you can find resources, it's so powerful to bring a poet into the classroom and quite often so many of the poets that we work with are um, people of colour, they are really engaging, they are so good at working with young people to kind of get them to think about why they should write their own work, what they might be interested in. So, you know, if you want a poet in your school, you could end up with someone amazing like Rachel, who came into my school. Um, and, you know, could be any, you know, so many of the poets that you read in things like the Complete Works, 10 Complete Works, they all do work in schools. So that was really important. And, you know, there are some really great resources, like if we're thinking about the canon. So there's um, something called Page Fright that's on our website where, like, there are poets that talk about a poem from the canon that really interests them and that has influenced them. So Benjamin Zephaniah is talking about Dylan Thomas and doing kind of performance of his work and then something of, um, and then reading Thomas, which I think is really interesting to kind of hear how the cadences of someone else's performance impact on canonical writing. But you had questions. Sorry. <laughs> Questions? 
questions are foolish questions, just ask a question. Yeah. So. Or even if we weren't clear about anything we were saying. Because, yeah, we both of us, we're all kind of talking yeah. the same. We're just rambling on. It's just because we really like what we're talking about. So. Well, tell us who you've enjoyed studying, you know, that's made an impact on you. I think I'd be really interested to hear about who you still study and who kind of made an impact. Everyone. Well, I think it's a kind of um, complicated thing, I think. Everything is complicated. Um, but I think one of the things that worries me a little is that like British and Asian poetry gets taught in schools to teach people about race instead of to expose people to ideas of yes. poetry and form and those kinds of things. And I just wonder whether that's something that you are conscious of. I mean, it's difficult because I know that when you're doing A-levels, you have to master a text, you have to know it really well and all of those kinds of things. But I, yeah, so I appreciate that it's a, you have a very selective and limited kind of range of things because of the pressure of that exam, but I just wonder if you feel that yeah, that that's is that the case for you that that you get taught that poetry to teach you about that experience or that culture? Is that is it true? I guess your your teachers are there, so maybe it's a yeah. 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 difficult. But the other thing I want to encourage you to do as well as um. As, as well as us talking about the learning and the this of poetry, it's the writing of poetry, and there's a lot of resources for that as well via school. I do a lot of my work outside of the school system. Um, and so, for example, there'll be places like Futureversity. And a couple of times, myself and a friend, we've taken a group of young people to outside of London for like five days on a retreat and just written poetry. <laughs> and it's been so much fun. And, and you know, and they didn't all have to be brilliant writers at all. They just had to show some kind of interest in writing. And they didn't even have to show the interest necessarily in poetry, just interest in doing some writing. And we would like take some poetry books with us. We'd tell them to bring something with them that they really enjoyed. And we'd spend about five days just, you know, them writing. And also, because of the centres we went to, they'd have to cook as well. And that was even more fun. And they try and, in the groups, outdo each other each night. So it's like, you know, that program, Come Dine With Me. So we play Come Dine With Me every night. So they have to write Come Dine With Me poems every night and as a group. So, you know, people would write in groups and they'd write individually. So just using what they had even learned in schools, different ways to do their own stuff. So I'd encourage, you know, people to kind of search out those things, kind of things as well about, okay, where can I... You know, spend some time going away with my, you know, with friends in places to write poetry. So, yeah. I have a feeling you were going to say something, right? No. Uh, in the middle of no? Yeah. yeah, you, you, you. Yeah. No? Yeah. Okay. Yes. You were. Yeah. Wait. Um, I was going to ask um, if you had, because you're all like very much in the poetry, if you had one vision that you'd like to see about poetry, what would it be? Something established or just something that really, really um, happened. What would it be? I wish I hadn't asked you to speak. <laughs> 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 That's a really difficult question. Oh, oh, That's an amazing question. Yeah, yeah. It's a great question. It's difficult. Yeah. I mean. <laughs> If I just bring it back down to the school that I was teaching at, like the library collection of poetry was terrible. And I think that what I would really like is to is for teachers and library school librarians to feel way more confident in selecting texts and to be a bit more open about it and to kind of update what they've got. So much poetry does get published and so much of the new stuff's really exciting and it's just not in schools. So you just, how are you supposed to find it? So I think, you know, poetry often gets sidelined. It's something that you can teach in like a single lesson. It's not treated in the same way that like teaching a novel is. Um, I, would like, I would like the teaching of poetry to change a little bit so that it was 
it was given equal weighting so that students could feel like it, they, you know, it was as precious and as important. Well, that is that is a really good question. Um, and next time, yeah, we will ask you. I think in the same way we have, I'm just talking off the top of my head now, in the same way we have Black History Month and we say Black History is not just a month, we have National Poetry Day. National Poetry Day is not just a day. <laughs> I really think poetry should be, is, is part of our everyday lives and we don't always even recognise it, really. Um, so if I just like people to feel more, um, and I don't know what's the word I should do use like sometimes I will buy I will buy two poet two of the same poetry books and I'll give one to a friend and I just think it'd be nice if people were it's somehow or other just kind of recognize the gift of beauty of giving somebody a poetry book mm. you know yeah I think I think that would really yeah I would like that and it could be like a little pamphlet it would be a bit big, big book or whatever yeah just make poetry books look beautiful and just give them those gifts it's a great gift. Okay, maybe I can add yeah. something now that I can, mm -hmm. I can riff off of you guys. <laughs> <laughs> but Wasan Shire talks about the way in which, in her own Somali stroke, Kenyan stroke, British culture, um, I prefer stroke to hyphen. I think it's, yeah. for obvious reasons, much more gentle um, <laughs> than the hyphen. Um, but she talks about the way in which poetry was kind of part of her everyday life. She's, I, I can't believe this is true, but I'm sure it's true. She said that her mum would often have little scraps of poetry written on gum wrappers in her handbag. I did not have a mother like that, so I feel really envious of that. But that sense of poetic form and expression is just all, you know, kind of is all around her. Um, so I really like that. I suppose I, yeah, like you, I wish that poetry was more central to curriculum, you know, at university as well, and that it wasn't just in a kind of designated poetry course, mm -hmm. that the difficulty of poetry was seen as something that is, you know, that is not insurmountable, but that is pleasurable, you know. Um, I think in the context of Caribbean poetry, um, I think there has been quite a lot of resistance to experimental, and I hate that word too, but, you know, because I think experiment is everywhere in poetry, mm -hmm. but in different degrees. Um, so I think there's been a lot of resistance to experimental poets who are, whose mes message is not readily available. So I guess I would want to shake that up a bit. And I wish people weren't quite so willing to categorize things as difficult or, you know, telling a straightforward story, those kinds of things. Um, yeah. Did we do all right? Yeah. <laughs> and that maybe performance, performance poetry doesn't keep get getting being talked about in a certain kind of way. You know, as if dub poetry, I'm looking at dub poetry being, as if dub and kind of standing there and, you know, is the only kind of performative mode. There are so many other performative modes, a whole spectrum that I, I think we don't recognize enough. So someone like Olive Senior who is very gentle and kind of unassuming, but perhaps a powerful punch, I would want to make a case for variety and performance. I thought well the most shocking, well it's not the most shocking, everything is shocking at the moment um, and in the scheme of things, but um, a young black woman who's also a poet told me that she had turned up at something and this happens to her all the time, I'm sure it happens to all of you who write poetry perhaps all the time, that she turned up and there was a lectern set up for the reading and she's a page poet so she writes, you know, she reads from her page um, and they said oh, we'll move the lectern for you because obviously you'll want to move your arms around. I just assumed that she was a, a performance poet of the mode that they had like imagined in their head and I think that needs to be undone. Like, be, you know, kind of black and Asian and writers write page poetry, they write beautiful crafted verse. Like they, and performance poetry is also beautiful and crafted but we can't just make these kind of weird assumptions about a person based on what they look like and what kind of poetry is going to come out of them just because you're like, oh, you're a black woman, I know what you're going to do. You're going to wave your arms around, that's completely bonkers. So, yeah, change your thinking. Because um, we're talking about Caribbean poets. <laughs> um, but and even, even, let me just go into one of the best performance poets, I think, who's not black, is John Hegley. Mm. He's just totally amazing. You know, and he has his ukulele. I mean, he, doesn't what they do he doesn't need a lecture. Yeah. He kind of looks at think, what's that? 
a weird piece of thing. Uh, they'll probably write a poem about it. Yeah, I'm, yeah, exactly. I'm with this group of lady. Okay. No Caribbean poets. If you want to kind of get a, a real general, uh, uh, have a look at the different kind of poets. There are people tree press online. Mm -hmm. They have got a website that you can just go and read different ages as well. And I work with them in terms of nurturing black British poets from people who've got one good poem up until trying to get them to a collection. And there's some amazing poets there, young poets, older poets, who are writing in all different styles. And they're from the UK um, and USA um, and, and in the Caribbean as well. So if you kind of want to check out, what's all this difference then about Caribbean poetry? And you'll realise it's just so vast. The only difference is where they come from, or where their poets come from, or where their, their parents come from. You know, so it's, it's worth just even kind of reading that. And they've got a lot of information on there as well, because the, um, the publisher, Jeremy Pointing, People Tree Press, People Tree Press are based up in, in Yorkshire. And in fact, a lot of the best small press is not in London. It's actually up there. And People Tree Press, um, and we were talking about dog poetry, and you go into the office with Jeremy Pointing, and he's deep into editing, editing really correctly, and you just see these bookcases of all of this dub music and reggae music, and he's probably got one of the best libraries of dub music ever. So then when we're kind of like doing books of, um, and, and looking at music in poetry, for example, and there's poets like Kwame Dawes, and people think that he's got all of his dub knowledge from the local reggae musicians or something. He's amazing. So, you know, his house I mean, is filled with jazz music and dub poetry, and that feeds him into editing our poetry and just being really an excellent, excellent resource. So even if you kind of even want to ask him a question about it, he'll just kind of go up into reams. So, you know, so poets, poetry houses like that, which is why these small ones are filled, they, they are really want to interact with a lot of people, especially schools and everything, and younger people, if you want to know more about what they're doing and about poetry. And, and Peter's also a teacher, so, you know, so, and in terms of, having that interaction and I wanted to bring just you know great poetry to 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 young people that well, publishers are there and they, they do that and they really enjoy doing that. Um, so the time. Yeah, I think we'd better because um so we're sorry to cut as much short and sorry if you have more questions maybe you could sort of um now the speaker in the break because um, we're gonna regroup here at six thirty for the poetry readings. So just so you've got enough time to hopefully go get something to eat and come back. Um, so should we um, give her um, a round of applause?